let's start with our solar system formation model. So first, um, let me ask you this question, which is based on what we've learned in the class so far, uh, which one of these rows in this table best describes the mix of materials in our solar system? So I am mostly seeing votes for D that the majority of the material in the solar system is hydrogen and helium. And the, uh, the material that's the least abundant is rocks and metals. And that's exactly right. So if we consider the solar system in terms of its total mass, 99.99 uh, .99 something percent of that mass is in the sun. And the sun is primarily made of hydrogen and helium. So by far the most material in the solar system is hydrogen and helium. Um, that's followed by ices. So as we saw in the last chapter, um, the comets in the Oort cloud uh, make up quite a bit of mass and uh, there's a lot of ice in the outer solar system. And so the ices, and by ices, we mean not only things like water ice, but also methane, ammonia, all of those things that are part of the giant planets, right? Those are what we consider ices. So that's the next most abundant type of material. And rocks and metals make a very small fraction of the whole. And in fact, if we look at the, um, if we actually count it all up and figure out what percentage is in each category, 98.2% is in helium and hydrogen, 1.4% total ices and 0.4% metals and rocks. So um, this composition uh, must match whatever was in the solar nebula that created the solar system. So there's nowhere else for materials to come from or to go to. And therefore the current composition of the solar system that we see today has to match its precursors. So I'm gonna go through the solar system formation model as if we are following a recipe. And these are the ingredients on our list. Okay, so let's look at the instructions for how to make a solar system. So first, um, I'll come back to these five steps. Um, these five I sort of chose because they seem uh, like a, a reasonable divide between uh, steps, but you, you could write this out in a different way. So the steps we'll follow are to first collapse, spin and flatten, cool, collide, and ignite. So I'll go through each of these in order and explain what they mean. So starting with collapse. So we're starting with this solar nebula, this big cloud of gas and dust containing all the raw ingredients of our solar system. And at some point, for unknown reasons, um, perhaps the gravitational influence of a passing star, uh, perhaps some temperature or density fluctuations within the gas cloud, uh, for whatever reason, that cloud begins to collapse. And nothing in space is perfectly stationary. Everything is spinning ever so slightly. So it, as it collapses, it begins to spin. And um, spinning objects tend to flatten out. And so our second step is after that gas cloud begins to collapse, it spins up faster and faster, flattens out into a disk, and we end up with one or more stars in the center and a flat planetary disk. Um, it turns out about half of the stars in the uh, universe seem to be in binary or multiple star systems. And so our sun is, you know, a singleton alone in space. All right, so let's talk about why this is that this rotating system flattens out. And to talk about that, we have to talk about the physics of angular momentum. And I'll try to put this as simply as possible. I'll show you an example in a video illustrating this idea. So angular momentum, you can think of it as kind of the oomph that a spinning object has. So kind of like what is the total amount of its spin? Um, and this can be a little hard to think about. So there are two factors that play into it that are easier to think about. The first is that angular momentum is bigger when you're spinning faster. So you can imagine that if you have a fast spinning object, it's gonna be harder to slow down. It has a higher angular momentum than a slower spinning object. Um, angular momentum is also bigger when there's more mass far from the central swing point. So I'm thinking of something like, um, you know, the shot put where you have the, you know, they in track, they have the rock, they put it in their kind of neck sort of, and then they spin around and then throw the rock, right? Um, but they put that mass close to their central point, close to the center of their body. That's why they put it right up on their neck. 
And the reason for that is because they want to build up their uh, fast spin before they toss the rock. If they tried to do that same spin up process, holding the rock far away from their body, it would be really hard for them to reach a fast spin speed to give that rock its, its quick initial speed. Okay, so those are the two factors is the spin speed and the mass distribution. And once an object has some angular momentum, um, that angular momentum must be conserved in, in, in the overall system. And so that means it doesn't change over time, but the parts that are making it up can change over time. So the rotation speed can change. And if it changes, then the mass distribution has to change along with it. So let me show you an example of that and what I mean by mass distribution. So if we consider an ice skater, for example, um, here, this ice skater has, you know, a center line somewhere, we could draw a vertical center line, and some of his mass is distributed away from that center line. So the leg the, that's touching the ice is relatively close to that center line, but the leg that's lifted is far from it. And legs are heavy, so there's quite a bit of mass far from the center line, giving him a larger mass distribution. Um, okay, so let's, you know, think about this scenario, um, we've, well, maybe not all watched figure skating, but hopefully you're familiar with the idea. So if an ice skater pulls their arms and legs closer to their body after they begin to spin, uh, will they then begin to spin faster or slower than before? Yeah, 100% correct. Um, ev everyone knows the ice skater spins faster than before. So rotational flattening, uh, for example, affects the dwarf planet Haumea, which is kind of shaped like a football. Um, it's also one of the dwarf planets with a ring, which is pretty cool. Uh, so it kind of bulges outward near its equator and is flattened from its poles. And this is an extreme example, but the Earth actually is rotationally flattened as well. So if you measured the Earth's circumference around the equator versus around kind of the prime meridian, uh, you would get two different numbers. It would be wider around the equator. Okay, so this rotational flattening is the reason that our solar system is not some kind of spherical shape, but a disk. Okay, so after we've collapsed our gas cloud and spun and flattened our solar disk, now we need to cool. So we let things cool. And as we do that, the, um, some solid material will condense out of the sort of hot gas and form eventually planetesimals. And we've seen all of the leftovers of this process, which are the asteroids, the comets, and the Kuiper Belt objects. And so this illustration shows that we start with small bits and blobs of material, and they're, you know, moving randomly in the hot solar uh, disk. So as they move, sometimes they'll crash into each other and stick together. And so over time, these pieces grow and grow as they coalesce, kind of like if you have a jar of oil and vinegar and you shake up the jar, eventually the oil blobs will find each other, stick together and condense out of the uh, vinegar system. So eventually the end product of this is planetesimals. All right, so as it cools, what, uh, which one of these graphs looks most like the temperature distribution in the solar disk? So I see most votes for C that the temperature is hottest near the sun and then falls off to lower and lower temperatures as we get farther away from the sun. Um, we've seen that before and that leads to differences in planetary composition as we know. So in general, this is also a bit of review. What is true about material that condensed out of the planetary disk near the sun? Okay, I see most um, votes for B that the material nearest the sun was high density material. And that's exactly what we see when we look at the densities of the planets, the ones nearest the sun are the most dense containing the most amount of rock and metal. And that uh, changes to icy materials uh, as we go farther out in the solar system. I suppose with the exception of Pluto, our planetesimal that uh, is really more of a Kuiper Belt object. And this is actually interesting. It tells us that those Kuiper Belt objects didn't form there. They did not form at their current location they were flung there eventually by the gravitational influence of the gas giants until they landed in the Kuiper belt, which is gravitationally stable thanks to Neptune's gravitational influence. Okay, so one more question then. Um, there is a something called the frost line 
which is the closest distance in the solar system where water can form. So if you think about being too close to the sun, it's too hot for that water to form ice, to condense out of the solar nebula or solar disk and form ice. So which one of these do you think best describes the location of that frost line? So um, it turns out that most of the water in the solar system is still beyond the frost line. So here we have um, Jupiter's moon Europa, Pluto, uh, Neptune's moon Triton, and then Callisto and Ganymede from Jupiter, Titan from Saturn. And the amounts of water that they have, this, the total volumes are shown by these blue spheres. And you can see that uh, if you added up all this water in the outer solar system, and also this water on Enceladus and Dione, which are other uh, gas giant satellites, that's way more water than the water on Earth. So even though Earth is a water covered planet, it has way less water than many other locations in the outer solar system. So this is because that water did form out there um, in the location of the outer solar system. And so that water had to be carried to Earth later somehow. So let me ask you, um, I'm not sure if your textbook mentioned this actually, but how do you think water got to Earth? Okay, I see most votes for C, that the water on Earth arrived as ice carried here by uh, maybe larger planetesimals, maybe smaller comets. And uh, this is one of the ideas for where the ice on Earth came from. It's also possible that the chemical ingredients of water, the hydrogen and the hydroxide, formed water in place on Earth. So those two hypotheses are actually uh, rather difficult to test. You have to look at things like the, um, the specific type of water, the, um, I won't get into the details, but if you look at the uh, specific signatures of the, of the water molecules, you can find out um, whether the hydrogen in that water best matches the rock hypothesis or the comet hypothesis. And this is an area of active research. So the jury is still out on exactly how water got to Earth, but most astronomers think that it arrived as ice on planetesimals. Uh, so that's because that water formed beyond the frost line. And so it had to be transported here somehow. Okay, so in our recipe, coming back to our recipe, we have now cooled the solar disk and started to produce planetesimals. And our next step is to collide planetesimals to form planets and to collect some primary atmospheres around those planets. So we, we still have a fairly chunky solar system, um, but as these planetesimals collide, they're going to coalesce into larger bodies. And then the large gravitational pull of those bodies can start to collect atmospheres. Okay, so after we've collided and gathered up our hydrogen and helium primary atmospheres, now the uh, sun finally ignites. So it starts to um, have nuclear reactions happening in its core, and this um, starts to generate the solar wind. And the solar wind blows away the rest of the leftover gas and dust. And so the hydrogen and helium that the terrestrial planets start with in their uh, primary atmosphere, they must have gathered that up before the sun ignited. Okay, so after it ignites, um, it pushes all the other material, at least the very light gases, out of the disk. So um, we've encountered the solar wind before. It's a stream of charged particles that are, that's generated because of the nuclear reactions in the sun. And what else have we seen the solar wind responsible for doing? So these ion tails, as we saw, um, the comets are melted by the sunlight, but then the charged particles streaming away from the sun carry along a uh, magnetic field that drags along the ionized gas from the comet to generate the ion tail. All right, so we've seen the solar wind do one other thing too, which is the charged particles that hit the Earth's magnetosphere funnel toward our poles and create the aurora borealis and aurora australis as they cause the gas in our atmosphere to glow. Okay, so now we're done with our solar system. We've gone through all five steps and it's a good bake. Sorry, I'm kind of obsessed with the Great British Bake Off right now. <laughs>